Welcome to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast with your hosts, Mike Randall and Gus Kearns. Welcome in, listeners, to the Screen the Screener College Basketball Podcast. We're always talking everything college hoops. Could have been anywhere else on the dial. You chose to be here with us, Mike and Gus. We appreciate that. Hope we're helping you get through a Final Four list weekend, the LAC Championship Monday, some sort of compromise, one shining moment. Hope that we're helping you get through and hope everybody's safe, healthy, calm. One of the teams that just might have been playing on Championship Monday includes the Dayton Flyers. There's a small group that you can put at the top of the conversation of possible national champions. You know, I think you know Kansas Jayhawks have to be included there. Gonzaga has to be included there as well. You can throw Baylor into the mix, San Diego State. But I think the Dayton Flyers, who did not lose a game in regulation this season, need to be included as one of those top-tier teams that could be playing for a championship on. So thankfully, we brought in uh, David Jablonski. Please give David a follow on Twitter at David P. Jablonski, capital D, capital P for the middle initial, capital J for Jablonski. You can follow his work over at Dayton Daily News. He covers everything Dayton Flyers related and a little bit of Reds. So if you're looking for a little baseball fix, David might be an outlet for that over at the DaytonDailyNews.com. We talked a little bit about David playing, I don't know, sounding board or therapist for Flyer fans over the last couple of seasons and what they were building towards this season. Of course, we discussed Obi Toppin's perfect storm of a season and some NBA prospects. Talk about the bond between uh, Obi, point guard Jalen Crutcher, and then we discussed the calm architect that is coach Anthony Grant. And if you look at accolades, this team is full of accolades. Player of the year, coach of the year. If we're going to call any team undefeated, we can call them undefeated in regulation. One of those special teams that makes our sport really neat. Just want to say some thanks out there. Thank you. Thank you, Spreaker, for getting the podcast out to everybody. Thank you, Bell Jar, including our intro and outro music. Thank you to the listeners out there. Thanks for tuning in. When there's no sports, hope we're helping just a tiny bit. If you really like what you're listening to, please don't forget to give the podcast a follow on Twitter at SES Podcast. Efficiency of keystrokes, of course. Please go over and give Mike a follow at Randall Rant. He is the brains behind the podcast. Say nice things about the things he's been putting out, pumping out technology wise. Like what you're listening to? Don't be afraid. Go over to your podcast consumption vehicle of choice. Leave a nice, kind review over at Apple iTunes or wherever you might be dialing us up. Thanks in advance. Hope everybody enjoys the spring thaw. Happy April. And thank you to David for giving us some time about the Dayton Flyers. Cheers. Welcome back in, listeners, to the Screen Screener College Basketball Podcast. We're always talking everything college hoops, even though there's no games to actually discuss. We're just trying to recap the season and maybe recapture some of the great moments and great programs and great teams and uh, unbelievable seasons. And one of those teams that falls into that category is your Dayton Flyers. We brought in David Jablonski from the Dayton Daily News to review and go over what happened out in Dayton it was an amazing season. Date, uh, David, how's everything going out there? Hanging in there as the stock answer these days. I'm going to go with that one. Uh, I'm doing all right. I'm happy to have a job still, which a lot of people can't say. So you got to look at the bright side. I'm safe and healthy right now where I live in Columbus. Let's stay on the positive side. We're going to try to recap a little bit of Dayton's historic season. 29-2, and two, not losing a game in regulation this season. You have the National Player of the Year with Obi Top, and you have the National Coach of the Year in Anthony Grant. David, the Flyers were kind of a transcendent force all throughout college hoops this season. Let's just start there. How was riding the flyer wave this season? How, how was that experience? It was just an unprecedented season from beginning uh, to the very unexpected ending. Dayton had never had a national player of the year. I don't think they really even had a national player of the year candidate in their entire history. Maybe in, maybe if you go back to the 50s when there weren't quite as many national awards. There seemed to be about a dozen national player of the year awards, uh, as I've right. discovered in recent weeks. Uh, and then the national coach of the year, too, Anthony Grant, uh, also a first for the program. Uh, you know, they had been in the top five of the country way back in the 1950s, which I, I guess you could say the modern era of college basketball. Uh, they had never had a season even close to this, uh, getting up to number three in the country. 29 wins was a school record. 20 straight victories to end the season was also a school record. So it was a lot of fun. I wrote about after the season how, as the beat writer, you're, you often feel like a therapist for the fans because they come to you with all their complaints when times are bad. And that was certainly the case two years ago. I was trying to keep them, you know, on the straight and narrow, stay patient. It will get better building something. I could see that coming, but I didn't see this kind of season. And uh, there weren't many complaints this season. The fans had a great time to be, from beginning to end. They mostly stayed healthy. They lost uh, Chase Johnson. Uh, he left the program in January because of some uh, concussion issues. But other than that, they were really lucky on the health front. And only two losses, both in overtime. And the second one, the first one, you know, you really couldn't complain about losing to Kansas in overtime right. in the Maui Invitational Championship. Uh, the second one was a little bit of a 
heartbreaker losing to Colorado, but boy, um, not a lot to complain about from November to the very bitter end when everybody had a lot to complain about all of a sudden. <laughs> I, well, thank you for playing therapist for all the Flyer fans out there. I'm sure they appreciate it. I tried my best. It's a tough job. <laughs> Especially after this season, no doubt, David. Now, not every college hoops conversation has a legit starting point, and we have that here. So let's just talk about the National Player of the Year and Obi Toppin. That's the fair starting line. He grew into one of the musty players this season, along with his highlights. His PER number ended up, you know, in the top 10 nationally with a 32.5. David, share a few factors that forged Obi into such a force this season and maybe go a little bit beyond the in-game windmill dunk or uh, the breakaway between the legs dunk that everybody got to view. What are some things that made Obi really special and the national player of the year beyond the highlight dunks? Just a perfect storm of fact, you know, allowed him to, to get to that level because typically an A-10 guy is just not going to get that kind of national attention. There was, of course, a big debate between the Iowa fans and Dayton fans about whether Luca Garza should have won these player of the year awards over top. And, and he certainly had better numbers, but Obi's efficiency was just unmatched. A lot of that was because of the dunks, but, you know, it's hard to dunk 100 and, uh, what was it, 103 times, 107 times, I think. It was a, there were a lot of factors. One, his teammates happy to let him be this, you know, give him – all those great passes at the rim, especially Jalen Crutcher, who was not only mm-hmm. his uh, point guard and main assist man, but his roommate and a uh, really good friend. Those guys called themselves peanut butter and jam, not peanut butter and jelly, because the jam, you know, for dunking. Uh, that was very clever uh, of them to, uh, to pick that little uh, nickname. It took me a second to get that one. Yeah, those guys are out on top of things. And, you know, they were, I think, part of the reason they had such success here this year because they had such big goals. Both of those two players, without me even asking them, the goal of winning a national championship last summer which I kind of scoffed at because at that point, I don't think you could even bet on Dayton to win the national title. There weren't any odds out there. They weren't listed among the 30 or 50 teams that usually get listed in all those emails the, the bookmakers send out. So I was like, well, I don't know about that. I mean, this was a program that hadn't even won the A-10 tournament outside of own arena in its history. It won one time at UD Arena, but other than that, it was really struggling in that tournament. So it was hard to imagine them winning six straight in the NCAA tournament. And honestly, that probably still wouldn't have happened, but we'll never know. They were certainly in the conversation when, uh, when everything came to an end, March 12th. So it'll be, yeah, he was just uh, a lot of things going on his way. Great personality, a guy who was, could handle the pressure and embraced it, embraced being the star, enjoyed it, motivated by all the eight ten opposing crowds, heckling him, calling him, chanting overrated over and over again. That kind of got cliched by the end of the year, but never really bothered him. You know, they built a team around him, really. Uh, the offense, uh, in a lot of ways, threw Obi, and he built his game, became a good, solid three-point shooter, high 30%. Shot well last year, but didn't shoot many threes. But this year, he shot a lot more threes and still made a high right. percentage. So that was a key factor. So he wasn't just a dunk machine. Played better on the defensive end. NBA scouts will probably say he needs to make more strides there. One of the most efficient scorers you can have in college basketball. Just didn't need a lot of shots to get his 20 points. I'm sure if he had shot more, he would have topped Garza in scoring. But, you know, he wasn't going to be a guy scoring 30 points very often. It didn't need to go that direction for your team and for your program because you mentioned a couple of the other pieces, you know, Crutcher being one of those important pieces. I feel like his game shares a lot of similarities with Brandon Clark of the Memphis Grizzlies, the former Zag. And in a league that values versatile wings, whether it be Giannis or Kawhi or LeBron or Paul George or even Tobias Harris and Jimmy Butler, do you think Obi will somehow be undervalued a little bit in this NBA draft class? Or do you think that NBA eyes realize what kind of diversity and what type of uh, versatility he provides on the offensive end? He certainly missed an opportunity to compete against some better players on the national stage when the tournament was canceled. But, I mean, I don't think he could have got any more press than he did during the regular season. And, and scouts were watching him the whole way and saw you know him respond in plenty of different situations. You know, he held his own against Kansas and, and Colorado and, you know, against the lesser, some of the lesser 18, 10 teams. He was, he was great, but uh, it would have been fun to see him, you know, what he could have done against uh, quality competition in March. So he didn't get that chance. And I don't know what kind of chances he's going to get bring with everything on hold, really. I talked to his, his godfather slash uncle slash men- mentor, uh, Victor uh, Moneris the other day. And he said, oh, he's got his own apartment and with access to a private gym. So that's pretty important. You know, stay in shape and sharp as well as much as he can by himself this spring, but that's going to be the case for everybody. And I don't know how that'll affect how they evaluate these scouts unless they're, unless they do get some time in May or, or June before the draft or if the draft moves back, which could be a possibility, I guess, you know, I think they saw enough. I think he'll be a lottery pick. I just don't, just don't know how high. I think lottery pick is the right. I, I think that's the right definition of what type of NBA prospect he is. And I think 
you're right. I think you mentioned it, David. Like, if NBA teams didn't get in and scout early, they might be behind the eight ball because of the limited opportunities. So I guess the last question about Obi is just three ball. That's going to allow for him to be successful at the next level. Does he own a few more feet of range? And will he be efficient enough from the longer three-point line? What did your eyes tell you from shoot-arounds and practice as far as Obi shooting three ball? Well, I think his percentage actually stayed pretty much the same this year when the, the line moved off from last year. And maybe I can't remember the second, maybe he improved a little bit. Uh, he shot so many more. He got off to a really strong start and was shooting the ball really well. And now he had a little bit of a slump midway through the season and was really shooting the ball better from three at the end of the season. So overall, really good touch, and I think he'll be fine once he adjusts to the the longer distance, but that can be a, certainly a big factor in his game. We know he can dunk. Maybe he needs to work on some of the post moves a lot, but he's really good moving without the ball and you know finding a way without forcing things too often. I think there were maybe a couple times where he felt like he was looked like he was trying to take over a game and it just wasn't going quite as well sometimes, but plenty of other times where he did take over games. He was very consistent, just a couple maybe off games here and there. Totally agree, and I think he definitely owns that type of shot profile that will extend out to NBA range. I think that'll work. David, I guess we need to talk about your coach a little bit here, too. When we talked earlier this season, one of the elements we discussed was his time on the NBA bench with the OKC Thunder, among other stops. So what defining characteristics or culture did Coach Grant employ to find sustainable success during this season and usurping any sort of expectations that came in with this Flyer team during the preseason? He just always came across as a calm and patient coach who was uh, building something for the long haul and made a lot of decisions that maybe it cost them in year one and year two, but were destined to pay off this year uh, from adding the four transfers that had to sit out last yep. season, um, especially Abby Watson, Rodney Chapman, and Jordy. Chase Johnson was the fourth. That one really didn't work because of his injuries. You know, those guys sat on the bench last year, and they could have added guys who played right away or other freshmen who could have helped last year, and they certainly needed another body. But, uh, you know, there were some sacrifices made, and it really paid off this year. 29-2, I think uh, a lot of fans would trade last year's 21 and was a 21-12 and record for a historic season that they had this season. So the key is, you know, building consistency, you know, not having those those down years and, you know, they're, they're going to have some challenges next year with the roster. They, right now they have five returning players and five newcomers, and that's assuming Jalen Crutcher returns. He's, he's put his name in the, in the draft, but I would expect yep. he'll probably be back. And they, they definitely have some options with three scholarships open to add some pieces, maybe a grad transfer. We'll see. So that would be a big help, especially if they can get a big man. You know, going back to even his first year, there were a lot of decisions made that were for the long haul, uh, building a roster, you know, a roster that would suit his needs, put guys who, you know, wanted to be there. And your guy's willing to play team ball. So, yeah, there were some decisions made all the way back from the beginning. But you got to give him a lot of credit for his first two uh, recruits, which were Obi Top or Jalen Crutcher and then Obi Toppin in those first months in 27th. Uh, those were the two biggest moves they made in building this uh, roster. It seemed like he had the right building blocks in place and the right foundation. If that of those are the first two recruits that he brought in as Flyers head coach. And we hate to ask this, but we kind of have to. Should Flyer fans worry about Coach Grant taking one more stab at a big-time job, college or NBA, or is Coach Grant and his staff going to fall into the, the Coach Becker of Vermont or maybe Coach Few of Gonzaga and not mess with success and happiness model? That would be hard to uh, imagine. I mean, I'm sure there's a job or two out there that that would interest him, maybe going back to Florida or he's coached so long under Billy Donovan. But, right. you know, he's a little bit older in his early 50s. He's are coaching at his alma mater. And he's moved around a lot and probably seen that the grass isn't always greener at the next stop. You know, he had a good position at VCU, made the NCAA tournament, you know, twice in three years, moved to Alabama, made it once in six years. I'm sure he was the same coach, same abilities, but for whatever reason, didn't have the same success. So there was no guarantee when you move on, as Archie Miller has found out at uh, Indiana, I'm sure he would probably still make that move because he's confident in his abilities, but how happy he's been in the last three years compared to how he was in the six years he was at Dayton. I don't know about the NBA. Uh, he was only there for two years. So, you know, I'm sure he's very comfortable here. I know he's well-paid. I'm not exactly sure how well-paid because being a private school, that information is pretty private. Contracts or extensions or anything like that. And I don't know if they will. They did with Archie, but I don't. they might keep that under the best. With Coach Grant, he was hired because they thought he would be 
a guy that could keep around and wouldn't necessarily jump to the next big job based, just based on where he is in his career, his uh, previous experiences. Certainly, I'm sure there are people out there looking at his name and thinking about going after him. You never say never because who knows what's really going on in the back of his mind. Right. Rarely do, rarely, rarely do we know that about coaches because, you know, they may not even know. I would be uh, surprised if he's in here for a long time. We're hopeful that he stays put and, and continues the success that he found this past season. And all the success that we talked about with Obi and Coach Grant winning their awards does not like all these accolades don't occur in isolation. Two of the reasons exists that your dual guard situation. You, we mentioned big shot maker Jalen Crutcher. You had Rodney Chapman, who was like kind of the fan of the opera, wearing his mask all season. They're both a pain on the defensive end. They both take great care of the ball. You know, Crutcher was one of the best late game shot makers, the side of Peyton Pritchard. I, I guess brag about your two lead guards a little bit and how much they contributed to the su- success of the Flyers this year. And then maybe if you want to expand, we can talk about Crutcher's draft decision. It seems like that's just par for the course for anybody that's going to get some buzz. That's kind of how it works right now. So brag about that backcourt a little bit, David. Crutcher just really took off. I mean, he was great last year, an all-conference performer, but you really saw the years of experience paying off this year. I mean, he was basically thrown into the fire as a freshman and starting job relatively early that year, if not midway through the year, I think. You know, they really needed a point guard when Scoochie Smith left. And, right. uh, you know, I talked to James Kane a couple before a couple weeks ago, or I guess last month, Anthony Grant went in the National Coach of the Year Award for the Basketball Times, and Kane was there for Grant's first year, is now at Iowa State. And he said when he, when they, he first got there in that April, they like, Anthony's like, we need a point guard. And they went out and got one, and they, they got a good one, you know, in Crutcher. Uh, has play, missed only one game in the last three seasons earlier this year. I think it was a spring day or something. I can't remember exactly. Very solid three-point shooter who still finds a way to run the offense. And I think the big deal this year was he got help from uh, Rodney Chapman, started every game, you know, gave Jalen a chance to rest here and there. Pressure wasn't all on his shoulders like it was the last two years. You throw in Ibby Watson, who was just you know, one of the best shooters in the country, at least into January before falling off a little bit. And suddenly you got three very experienced guards, and that's what the team will be built around next year, assuming Kreischer comes back. I don't know. From the looks of it, he's just exploring it like like Obi right. did last year. There's no hurt in doing that. In fact, if you're in his spot, you should definitely do it. It's a good experience. I don't know how the current lockdowns across the country will affect that. I mean, it will even get any workouts with scouts. So can't imagine anything's going to happen soon, but right. it certainly looked like uh, he could play in the NBA the way he performed this year. I yeah. think with all the scouts that came to watch Obi, I'm sure they had another page in the notebook. They took a whole bunch of notes on Crutcher and what he was doing as right. a league guard in your situation. So, I, you know, I bet prepared NBA teams have the research that they need with Crutcher and they'll make a good decision. on. And you're right, David, everybody that's going to declare for the draft is just going to do it because that's what's happened the past three, four, five years. You declare, you get your information, and then you make your decision off that information. But I think it's going to be hard to obtain that information in this current situation for any of those guys that are kind of fringe second round guys, or maybe two way guys, or maybe summer league invite guys. I think if they don't have that information, why not just come back to school, get one more year where you know you're going to, you know what, you know the results you're going to get, you know the coaching staff that you're going to work with. So why not go back to some familiarity? That that seems to make sense. And, And let's play fortune teller here a little bit, David. Speaking of lead guards, you just mentioned Ibby, you know, we, we mentioned Chapman. One of the things that we always fall back on in March is that guards win in March. Play fortune teller for us here, David. How many wins would those guards help gather in March? Would it be two to get to a Sweet 16? Would it be another Elite 8 run like you did with Arch? Could it be a Final Four? Or realistically, like you discussed earlier, could it be six to win the whole darn thing? Allowed Flyer fans to dream just a little bit here, Dave. I think everybody thought they could go all the way. You know, when they uh, got into March, they were really rolling. A couple dominant performances to close out the season. Everything was clicking. Yep. I think anything short of a Sweet 16 would have been uh, a disappointment. Anything more than that, everybody would have been okay with that, considering how much success they had in the regular season. And I think everybody wanted to see if they could win the A-10 tournament. As I mentioned, they haven't done that. It's 2003, and that was at their own arena. So that's been a, something everybody talks about every March, about how they've struggled. They haven't even won a game in that tournament since 2016, Archie's second to last year. Didn't get a chance to play a game this year. So it's going to be the great what if we'll talk about for the rest of our lives. I'm a Cincinnati Bearcat fan, so I know that well, having a cheer for that 2000 team that lost Kenny Martin to the broken leg. <laughs> and they still write stories about that team, it seems like, almost every March. What could have been? And this team is having not had a chance to even play a postseason game, it's even worse. I mean, it doesn't get any worse than that when you talk about what ifs. We'll never know. It's going to be the big question. But if everybody comes back, 
those three guards, assuming there's college basketball at all next season, which I think we're going to think about the possibility that that might not happen next year. But at least Don't scare people, David. Don't scare people with that information. Uh, oh yeah, you bet. We're, everybody's already starting to prepare themselves for that. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe we'll just get an NCAA tournament next year. I'd, I'd take that at this point. Just pick the bracket as whatever teams did this year, and we'll we'll go with what we got. But man, it seems like a long way away getting any sports back. Yeah, it'd be a great story if they get back to the tournament next year, whatever, no matter what happens. I totally agreed. Let's let's uh, let's go inside the A10 a tiny bit, uh, David. You know, Richmond found its way into brackets and prognostications. Rhode Island was really fun with Fats Russell. Maybe talk. Is there any other team inside the A10 you think could have won a game or made a little noise in March? I guess Richmond would probably be the best candidate. A-10 was supposed to be better, and I think it certainly was better. Look at the mm. Ken Prom conference rankings. I think it was up a couple spots. I can't remember. I didn't look at the end of the season because, you know, once it all ended, it was, like, tough to look at anything college basketball related. Sort of tailed off at the end, too, because, you know, VCU started strong, and it really fell apart at the end because of some injuries and other issues. Total collapse from the preseason favorite. Rhode Island played so well for so long and won 10 games in a row before it it lost its first game to Dayton. It was just not the same after losing that game. And it also had some injury issues at the end. Uh, just got crushed by Dayton <laughs> at home. Very surprising result and kind of shows you just what Dayton was capable of, of at that point on Obi's birthday, beating his brother for the second time. Uh, wasn't that long ago. But it seems like years ago at this point. So, yeah, it was a better conference. It was still not as good as it could have been considering how the best teams fell off. And, uh, you know, Richmond did play better especially after they got Blake Francis back. Uh, you know, they could have maybe won a game in the tournament if they had received a bid. Uh, certainly would have been a contender in the A-10 tournament if that had, You know, it might have very well could have been a one-bid league if Dayton had won the A-10 tournament. probably would have been. That's that's interesting. I think, how about this? We'll, we'll, I think we'll find the finish line here. I, Richmond might have been one of those teams that played on Tuesday or Wednesday in the NCAA tournament, you know, at your spot in Dayton. Do us a favor. Just let the listeners in, open the door a little bit. What's the... What's the vibe at that first four on Tuesday and Wednesday? And does it, what, what were people missing? Cause people were so, we were so close to getting to that Tuesday and Wednesday in those games. And then literally less than a week prior to that, the, the rug gets pulled out. Uh, everybody misses out on that. So maybe just try to explain the vibe that exists during the first four out there in Dayton. It's a great event. The city, the university, everybody takes great pride in hosting it year after year. Uh, UD Arena has hosted more NCAA tournament games than any other arena in the country, and it's by a wide margin now, and it grows every year because they get those four games every year, and sometimes they get you know first and second round games too. You know, it's a lot of fun. depends on what teams show up, and you know, usually there's a couple prominent teams there along with 16 seeds. It was an interesting, could have been an interesting mix this year. I don't know who would have ended up there, but at, at various times, Lenardi and some of the bracketologists had teams like Indiana, which would have been a crazy story seeing Archie Miller again at UD Arena. Uh-huh. Cincinnati and Xavier were maybe in the mix have ended up at Highway uh, up Interstate 75 at UD in the first floor. That would have been interesting. Dayton fans hate Xavier, so they would have cheered wildly against them. Richmond had ended up there. Yeah, they would have probably been supported by the Dayton fans pretty uh, pretty well. I think it was the same story a couple years ago in St. Bonaventure. Played there and uh, beat UCLA, I believe, in the first round. Dayton fans were definitely on uh, the side of the Bonnies. I think Dayton fans would have cheered for, for almost any A-10 team that ended up there. I don't know about VCU. We'll see. I don't know. That would be a tougher one for some Dayton fans. <laughs> That's kind of the big rival right now. But, yeah, it's a, it's a great event. It's interesting. On the day the first four would have happened this year, uh, that Tuesday, instead of basketball being played, there was a uh, coronavirus testing site in the big parking lot outside the arena. Quite uh, fast. It definitely illustrates the transition and the difference of where the focus was as far as everybody anticipating filling out their brackets. And then the, that anticipation went into just preparation and straight up fear in some places. It, yeah, I think that just paints the picture of where we are at, where we're now with sports, David. Well done. Uh, let's get you out of here on your final uh, T three T quick questions. I asked you this earlier, but what's one of the best craft beers or breweries that's close to Dayton or to Columbus, where you're at right now? Oh, there's so many this year. And Dayton, you know, Dayton Beer Company, Land Grant, it's one of my favorites because you can watch games there. I mean, when there were sports going on, you could watch games there. I just ordered a, a big shipment of beer from uh, Wolf's Ridge early in the stay-at-home era for them to get them delivered to my doorstep. We, we all need our beer during this time. And you're stuck at home with a toddler for many hours a day. It sounds like that's a good plan to have it delivered. Sounds like you're you, yeah, you've got a little part of this uh, a little part of this figured out. I think if nothing else, listeners, maybe look into your your local brewery delivery system and see if that's an option for you guys. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think there are a lot of them are doing that at least in Ohio. There's definitely a bunch of them doing it in New Jersey as well. 
Yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, players who we trust, you know, we talked about Jalen Crutcher being one of the best shot makers. Go across the nation, go wherever you want with us. Trust. Who's the one player in the nation that you trust with a last pos- last second possession to win the game? Whose hands are you going to put the ball in? Well, I can't go too far across the nation because my focus is so much on Dayton during the season. I don't get to watch much else other than maybe some 8-10 games. But yeah, I'll go with Crutcher. He just uh, yeah. hit so many big shots, including that last second three to beat St. Louis. And that really changed the course of the season because it let him get into the you know the top and then the top five and let them get to the 20 game win streak and the 29 win and you know without that crazy finish you know the season would have been just a little bit less historic still would have been great but you need those kind of shots to get to the next level and uh, if colorado hadn't made one in chicago on december 21st they would have got the 30 wins for the first time they would have gotten there for sure if they had, had the season canceled at the end but it was a uh, it was an amazing season and I'd, I'd give the ball to crutcher i think if you give the ball to crutcher that's one of the smartest moves that you can make <laughs> you'd look like yeah. a really smart coach if you did that that's for sure and then we'll get you out of here on this tunes what have you been listening to while you're longing for sports to return we talked a little bit about camp spelled with two a's last time around any podcast or music suggestions for the listeners out there i've listened to many less podcasts since i've been stuck at home because i listen to most of the, mostly listen to, listen to podcasts when i'm driving sometimes when i'm running but mostly when i'm driving um, before this all end i mean i listened to the titus and tate podcast uh, quite a bit during the season those guys Dayton bandwagon from the very start in Maui. Drove it right to the end, right off the cliff, as I uh, wrote uh, <laughs> the other day. <laughs> they were on it to the very end. In fact, fact, still were on it, I guess, after it all ended. But, uh, yeah, those guys do a, f- a fun, uh, do a good job uh, talking about college basketball. Really gave Dayton a lot of praise this year, and so that was kind of fun to see. So I'll start there. As for music, I mean, I'm still a kid of the 90s, so I end up listening to the, uh, the 90s channel on uh, Amazon Prime quite a bit when I'm running. So I love, still love the Counting Crows. I need to do a better job of keeping up to date on the new music, though. That's a little hard. I'm, I'm really good at keeping up on the new Netflix shows, but music. Uh, we, we love that Titus and Tate were back, too, doing their thing. We totally enjoy them. Nothing wrong with going a little nostalgia and digging in the crates a tiny bit and hitting the 90s music that, that helped raise you. That's okay, David. Hey, we just want to say thank Thank you so much for jumping on the Screen Screener College Basketball Podcast to talk some Dayton Flyers hoops. Please stay safe, strong, and healthy out there, and then maybe we can catch up during the preseason again, David. Thank you so much. Cheers. Salancha. Grazie. Grazie. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Side.